use of animals is a bit shorter. Um, and so these will focus on our small bodied aquatic invasive species. And we focus on those um, because they're ones that are easily transported on, you know, boats or bo like fishing equipment. And so we can take prevention measures to prevent the spread of these invasives. So um, first I wanted to start with identification of spiny water flea. This one is in about 10 water bodies here in the Adirondacks and one that we think is, um, it, well, it seems to be spreading more in the recent years. The, last, the most recent um, infestation that we've had though is um, I believe in Lake Champlain in 2014, as well as Indian Lake in that same year. Um, so we haven't had any new reports in the last couple of years now. But um, for identification of spiny water flea, it's an in invasive zooplankton, so a tiny crustacean that floats in the center of the lake in the water column, and it will travel up and down in the water column looking for food. It's um, where it gets its name is this spine that takes up more than half of its body length here. And so it is um, visible to the naked eye, but very small. So the, on the bottom left hand photo here, you see um, two different spiny water fleas on a pinky nail. And um, they're, they're pretty clear, so, but with some coloring, so you are able to see them. Um, they have two different ways that they reproduce. The first is asexual, and so it'll go through asexual reproduction in, throughout the summer. And so it, you really see the populations um, expand and expand throughout the summer, and then it'll be at its highest in the fall through that asexual reproduction. And then in the fall, it will go through sexual reproduction and create resting eggs which are this individual in the upper left picture has resting eggs in the pouch on its back. And so in the fall, it'll die and the resting eggs will sink to the bottom of the lake and then they'll overwinter as resting eggs and hatch in the spring. Um, with spiny water flea, um, we often will have the first reports of it in a new water body from our anglers or fishermen. Um, if, you if you have anglers who are, trolling for lake trout or other big game fish um, and running a line through the water, the little spines um, or barbs that are on the spine of the water or spiny water flea will catch on fishing line. And when you reel in the line, you'll get these long globs that kind of either look like, you know, like gelatin or maybe wet cotton. And it's just a, hundreds and hundreds of spiny water flea that have gotten caught on the line and clumped up. And so usually they're the first, you know, often are the first ones to find spiny water flea and report them. Um, so the impacts of spiny water flea are that they like to eat native zooplankton of a similar size to themselves. And that native zooplankton are great, uh, a great food source for our small forage fish and young game fish. And so with that long spine, they also aren't great food themselves. If you can imagine, they're kind of like eating a bunch of toothpicks potentially with that long spine. So because they're not good food, and then they eat the food that would be available for a lot of our native species, we see impacts through our food web because of that. We also see, um, my, my photos here of the two different bags are zooplankton toes that I collected. The clear one is the one um, with pretty much just spiny water flea in it. And then on the right is a lake, or the darker, more green photo is of a lake that does not have spiny water flea. And we just, we saw more di diversity of the native zooplankton in the samples that we collected. And then we will see impacts to anglers potentially as the, spiny water flea gets clumped up on the line, it can kind of gum up the, the line as you reel it in and potentially lose fish that way. We also have a kind of a cousin to, to the spiny water flea, fish hook water flea, that showed up in Lake Champlain a couple years ago. And it looks very similar to spiny water flea. Um, here's a comparison photo on the right. You have spiny water flea on the bottom and above that one is the fish hook water flea. So overall, in, in its body is smaller than spiny water flea, but it has a long 
spine, just like spiny water flea that has a characteristic hook on the end. And so um, the fish hook water flea have very similar impacts um, to the food web and to fishing that spiny water flea does. And so we think that this species is being spread in little pockets of water, in fishing gear, in boats, as well as when it gets caught on fishing line and the fishing line isn't appropriately cleaned, it could be moved around that way as well. Next, um, we have zebra mussels in the region, which is kind of a poster child of aquatic invasive species. They're a rather small mussel, about uh, an average, about an inch in length, they'll get up to. They're a D-shaped shell with stripes where they get their zebra name from. Um, they're, one of their distinctive characteristics is that out of the bottom, base of the shell, so on the right, upper right, you see a photo with threads coming out of the bottom, and those are bissel threads. And these bissel threads will help um, the muscle kind of, they'll dig in and get and connect to hard surfaces. Um, any hard surfaces they come across, whether that's rocks, whether that's shopping carts, whether that's native mussels, um, and they'll just cover um, hard, you know, the hard surfaces in the lakes that they infest. And then we'll also see the shells of the dead individuals showing up on shore. Um, in the Adirondacks, they're mostly, we have a big population in Lake Champlain, and we have a couple of inland waters that do have some populations, but overall a lot of our lakes don't have enough calcium in them to support a population of zebra mussels. Their impacts are that they're very, very good filter feeders. So they're filtering the water and taking out algae, um, which is the base of our food webs. And so they'll, they'll take all this algae out of the water column so it's not available for our native species. And as they're taking this algae, they're taking good algae and not necessarily um, eating the bad algae that might cause um, problems such as um, harmful algal blooms. Um, and then also as they're taking that algae out of the water column, they're actually making the water more clear, which has some different impacts. Um, we see more aquatic plants being able to grow deeper because of the clear water. And we see changes in where the thermocline then is in the lake. It, it, de it drops. And so it ha then we have less of a cold water refuge um, in the deeper parts of the lake. We also see impacts to uh, some like our native mussel species when they're covered in, in zebra mussels, they just can't thrive. Um, with the shells showing up on the shore, those cause problems um, to people trying to enjoy the beaches. And then we also see um, issues with zebra mussels showing up in the intakes and um, of, for water for industry. And we think with zebra mussels, they're, they're spreading both by attaching to, you know, attaching to boats and trailers, um, as well as they have a life stage called a veliger, which is the young, the young stage of the zebra mussels that's free floating and it can be moved in little pockets of water. Um, we have a cousin that's not yet in the region, so it's one of our watch species or our tier one prevention species, quagga mussels. And um, so it looks very similar to zebra mussels. It has, um, here's our comparison of our zebra mussel photo on the top left and underneath it is the quagga mussel. Um, the quagga mussel has a little bit different shape to it. So if you look um, at the lateral, the lateral view here, um, a zebra mussel has a flat, more flat bottom to it. So you're able to set the zebra mussel up and it won't tip over. But with the quagga mussel, it has a more rounded bottom if you look at the lateral view there. And so if you try to set it up, it will fall over. And then also how you tell quagga and zebra mussels apart is on this right comparison photo, you have the zebra mussel on the left. And if you look at the bottom of the zebra mussel, you'll see that hole where the bissel threads come out. And then the line that goes across um, is more symmetrical than for the quagga mussel, where you have more of a curve or an asymmetrical groove to it. 
Um, and so I should mention with quagga mussels, it has very similar impacts to zebra mussels where it's a very good filter feeder um, and it will attach to hard surfaces. We also um, see it showing up a little bit in greater water depths than zebra mussels and um, it can attach to softer materials than zebra mussels. Um, lastly, we have, um, we, we don't have quag mussels here, but we have it in the Great Lakes and some of the Finger Lakes. I apologize if people hear my daughter in the background. She is trying to come in to say hi. Um, so we have a comparison of, um, oh, next I'd like to talk about Asian clams. It's one of our invasives in the region. We only know of it to be in Lake George. And so with Asian clams, it's a pretty small clam. It gets to be about a 50 cent piece maybe in size or about a, maybe even just a quarter. Um, it has a very round shell with symmetrical concentric circles. And those, um, those, those rings that it has on its shell are pretty, pretty exaggerated. So if you were to have an Asian clam shell and you were to run your finger nail across those, those ridges, it would feel almost like corduroy or you'd definitely be able to feel it. Um, it tends to be a light brown or tan in color. And then on the inside, it'll be um, a kind of a, a white or purplish in color. It has distinctive um, um, indents where the two shells come together. It has these three grooves that slide together for the two different shell pieces. And then overall, I'd say Asian clams are just a stronger, more robust shell than some of our native clams um, would be. For impacts for Asian clams, um, again, they're also very good filter feeders. So we see impacts like we, we did with zebra mussels, where they're going to be filtering algae um, and um, taking out all that good algae, that good food base, and kind of just leaving the, the bad algae. Um, we also see impacts with um, their shells after they die, showing up in vast, large numbers on beaches, and um, also clogging intakes as well for industry. Next, I wanted to talk about Chinese mystery snails. It's one of our invasives in the region. Um, so far, we've had it reported in about 15 water bodies in the region, but we think it's been pretty underreported for us. Um, it's a large brown snail. Um, it can get up to, I'd say, about golf ball sized. Um, here's it in someone's hand so you can see the large sizes. Anya, I need you to go back down and find Daddy. Okay, well, I'll be right down. Sorry, everybody. Um, and so for how you identify Chinese mystery snails is that they have this percula, operculum or trap door that when they're out of the water, they kind of close up into that, that operculum. Um, you'll also see that they tend to be this dark brown in color. For impacts, their impacts aren't very well known. Um, they can get to be high in abundance, and so their shells will, will when they die, they'll come onto shore and be pretty smelly. Um, they also are, um, they're more, they're scrape feeders, so they'll go along and they'll kind of scrape the algae off surfaces. And so they're taking away that food source for native um, species. Lastly, I wanted to talk about rusty crayfish. It's not, we haven't had any recent reports for our region of rusty crayfish. Um, there are, have been reports in, on the eastern shore of Lake Champlain, um, as well as historic reports of it in Scroon River. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for it. Let me know if you come across it. But so for rusty crayfish, it's a large crayfish. Um, the most characteristic um, the thing I would point out is these rusty red spots that it has on its side, almost as if somebody dipped their fingers in paint and then picked up that crayfish and left the paint on the sides. It also has tips with black bands um, on the, the tips of its claws. 
um, the impacts of rusty crayfish are that they're almost like little lawn mowers where they'll go through a lake and they'll just um, they'll just remove the aquatic plants. Okay, Anya, I'm talking to people here. So um, they'll just go and they'll, they'll remove the aquatic plants. And so my photos here are on the top, a lake that had a lot of rusty crayfish in it. Um, you can see that a lot of the native aquatic plants are gone. And the, then the project was that they went in and they removed a vast majority of the rusty crayfish population. And once that happened, they saw a lot of the native aquatic plants return to the lake. And so again, um, this one is not yet, that we haven't had recent reports in the region. However, it is historically been a popular bait fish. So we do occasionally see it showing up in people's bait buckets if they intend to use it as, as bait, but which is, is illegal, but we do, do see that happen on occasion. And so with that, um, that was the end of my animal identification portion. Um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on chat. So if, Emily Bell, if you've been able to, if there's any questions that have showed up. Mom, I'm going to go. So um, first question that Emily's rounded up is that I read that zebra mussels were found in a New York State fish hatchery in the Mohawk Valley area. Can you talk about this? And so um, I, I don't know too much beyond what has been, has been in the news, but there was um, zebra mussels found in the waterway that the Rome fish hatchery um, takes its water from for their fish. And so DEC has been very careful about where those fish have gone since the hatchery. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know too much beyond that, but I'd highly recommend if you're curious in learning more to reach out to DEC for more details about that. Um, the next question would be, do Asian clams need an abundance of calcium? And so um, Asian clams do also have kind of a lower threshold of how much calcium they need in the waterway to establish. It is a bit less than zebra mussels. Um, I think zebra mussels are about 12 milligrams per liter of calcium, and Asian clams, I want to say, are about five. Um, so, yeah. And then the third question is, how do you tell a Chinese mystery snail from natives? And um, for the Chinese mystery snail, it does get quite a bit larger than our native snail um, snails do. Also, that operculum, um, for the most part, is a good characteristic, the operculum or trapdoor. There, there is one, at least one native that can get a bit larger that also has that operculum, the brown mystery snail. Um, but the brown mystery snail, that's our native, is a little bit lighter in color. The overall shell shape of the brown, native brown mystery snail is a bit more elongated and thinner. Um, and then how the perculum fits, it's not as snug um, as the mis Chinese mystery snail's shell. Um, I can definitely send out some resources after this to help with identification of these um, so if people wanted to know more details. Um, so I think there's a few more questions that have popped up. Let me see. So are there native snails that have large populations? And I would say that there are definitely native snails that have large populations. Um, and so, so it definitely, um, you, you, will come, you will come across native snails in large populations. Um, another one, about four years ago, we had a large snail kill on Scroon Lake. These have been Chinese mystery snails. Um, and I would say that, I, I don't know. I know, you know, there can be die-offs of native snails as well as the invasive snails. Um, I would say that for the Screen Lake, um, let us try to get some photos of, of that snail that you saw a few years ago and we can confirm identification of it. Erin? Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, it's not unusual to have spring die-offs of the banded mystery snail. Um, the banded could be an, 
invasive species or it could be a native. There's some question about it, but it's been here for a very long period of time um, and is present in very large numbers in most of our regional lakes. And it's not uncommon to have spring die-offs with that species. Sorry, I'm gonna sneak, I have to help my daughter for a second. Um, Larry, do you mind seeing if you can answer? I think we might have a few more questions. Sure. Good luck. All right, let's take a look here. So what's the next question? Does Great Sockandaga Lake have spiny water fleas? Uh, yes, it does. Um, and also Sockandaga Lake, which is uh, up near Pasico also is known to have a pretty good sized population of spiny water fleas. Uh, let's see, what did I miss? Uh, okay, someone uh, has stated that if your, lake if your lake association does have stocking via DEC, you might want to check to see if your fish are coming from the Rome hatchery. Good precaution. Uh, just had a large die off on Lake Snow. I suspect that those are the banded mystery snails. We get quite a few reports uh, of die off uh, late spring, early summer of this particular snail. As the water rapidly warms up, um, snails that have just barely made it through the winter uh, tend to die off, and you get a lot of them floating in. Okay, so thank you, Larry. I, okay. I, I think I'm back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, we're, we're down to the question about uh, does the state or park have any plans for mandatory boat washing? Right. Um, and so I know there's been a lot of discussion about, about you know, voluntary versus mandatory boat washing. And um, I think there'll be a lot of conversations going on over this next summer. Um, currently, we are we have a transport law in the state, which is that you cannot transport um, any attached plants or animals um, on your boat and in, you know launch it into a waterway. And so that has been extended um, through this summer. And so I know you know there will be lots of conversations about about what our spark prevention program will look like in the future. Um, and so if you're interested, I'd highly encourage you to just um, become involved in those conversations as, as they go on over the next year. Um, okay. So we've got some different comments. And um, so I'd, I'd encourage people to check out the chat if they haven't. And then um, for this last question, we have: Does fishing tackle have to have to clean? Sorry. So um, it's about fishing tackle and um, cleaning it from one waterway to the next. And yes, there's some invasives like the um, the invasive zooplankton that could potentially be transported on fishing equipment. And so it is very important to make sure that those are inspected. Um, and cleaned between each each outing. And so there's, um, I, I would encourage drying out if possible. If you can allow your equipment to dry for five days, that should kill invasives that might be attached to it. But if not, um, visiting one of the free boat, boat washing stations offered from Paul Smith College and some other partners around the region are also a good way to get things treated. And um, so we have questions. So are there state regs controlling commercial sale of aquarium plants and pond plants? And yes, we do have, um, it's called part 575 for short. And so um, that essentially has um, listed different aquatic and terrestrial plants and animals that have been deemed invasive species and they are um, categorized into prohibited or regulated species and there's rules surrounding owning, owning those, selling those, transporting those. Um, and so I would en encourage everyone to look into part 575 um, for the laws surrounding those. 
Um, so I think we're getting tight on our next time. So I think we're going to move along. If you guys have any follow-up questions, hopefully we'll have time at the end um, to, to answer a few more questions. And if not, you can always email either myself, Emily Bell, or Larry with follow-up questions. So next, I wanted to transition to the monitoring and reporting techniques for, for volunteers. Oops. 